Hi everyone and welcome to this video on feature extraction in AlphaFold. I'm Killian Menton and this video is the fourth in our series where we will be implementing AlphaFold from scratch. It's also the first one where we are doing AlphaFold specific content. That means that if you are already familiar with machine learning and attention, you're good to start here. Just know that you'll either need to finish the implementation of the multi-head attention module from last video's assignment or copy our code from GitHub to go through with the AlphaFold implementation yourself. Feature extraction means converting the domain-specific data formats we want to use as inputs into tensors, the data format for machine learning. There are two non-obvious questions here. The first one is what that domain-specific data should be, that is, which biological data actually contains information on protein structure. And the second is how we convert that data into tensors. So let's get into it. AlphaFold uses three types of inputs. The first is the one you'd most likely expect, the amino acid sequence of the protein you want to predict the structure of. It is given as a string and each letter represents one of the 20 amino acids. But AlphaFold uses two additional inputs that try to get information on the structure from the protein's evolutionary history. The first of these two is MSA data, which is short for multiple sequence alignment. It is a list of protein sequences found in other organisms that are highly similar to the target sequence, which means they probably originate from the same ancestor. And the last is the three-dimensional structure of so-called templates, proteins that are very similar to the target and where the structure has already been determined. Historically, this has been the most relevant data for structure prediction. Interestingly enough, AlphaFold doesn't really seem to need the template stack as input in particular if the MSA is diverse and provides rich evolutionary information. We won't implement the template stack in AlphaFold to make the code easier to follow, and it might be less used than you think anyway. In the popular online tool ColabFold, for example, the template stack is disabled by default as well. After construction of the inputs, AlphaFold feeds them through the input embedder and the Evo format, as shown here. Without the template stack, the input pipeline looks like this. These two parts, input embedding and the EvoFormer stack, are what we'll do in the next two videos. Today, we'll construct the four tensors on the left. Two of them we can directly check off. Residue index is nothing but the range from 0 to R-1 to be used for position encoding. And target feed is simply a one-hot encoding of the target amino acid sequence, using 21 tokens for the 20 amino acids and an additional unknown token. The construction of the two MSA features is a little more complicated. We'll start with a quick introduction to what sequence alignments are. Proteins are sequences of amino acids. We can extract a lot of information from the evolutionary history of proteins. For example, we can check if a region is highly conserved over different proteins or if it's less so and changes a lot. That might tell us if the sequence is closer to the center and interacts with many residues to produce the three-dimensional structure or if it's a loose loop. Another possible analysis is to look for residues that only switch together, so-called co-evolution. Since mutation is random, we generally expect the residues to change independently of each other. But evolution often sorts out mutations that show a loss of function. That means if two residues often co-evolve, they might interact with each other, and if one of them is substituted, the other one needs to undergo substitution as well to form a stable protein. Explicit calculations like these were commonly done in the past, but you can imagine that there are way more, deeper correlations within biological sequences. For that reason, there's been a paradigm shift in sequence analysis. Instead of relying on manually crafted algorithms for specific tasks, we now train general statistical models and machine learning algorithms on large datasets. These models are capable of learning complex patterns and making predictions directly from the data, offering a more flexible and powerful approach to understanding genomics. And this is also how we'll handle it in AlphaFold. Knowing that the evolutionary history might be helpful for structure prediction, our first step is to find sequences that are similar to our target sequence. The problem here is, proteins can mutate by substitution, insertion or deletion, meaning we can't just compare positions pointwise. The introduction of a new residue would misalign a large part of the sequence, even though it isn't that big of a change. This is why we do alignment, where we try to estimate where insertions and deletions happened. We allow the algorithm to insert a special gap token, denoted by a dash, to align the sequences as best as it can. This is done by the Needleman-Wunsch algorithm. 
It assigns scores to correctly aligned amino acids, wrongly aligned ones, where the penalty depends on the type of substitution, and gaps in the alignment. Finding the optimal alignment can be solved quite elegantly using a method called dynamic programming, but we won't go into the details here. The big problem is that the sequence databases are vast. To keep them in memory, you can expect to need about 70 gigabytes of memory, more than what typical hardware can offer. This is a big part of the computational cost of running AlphaFold. In this series, we won't compute the alignments ourselves, but use pre-computed ones. The alignment file we use for testing the implementation was generated by the ColabFold notebook. You get the file together with the structure prediction when running ColabFold. The ColabFold notebook itself runs on a free-to-use Google machine, like all Colab notebooks, and that hasn't the specs to do sequence alignment either. The ColabFold notebook queries a public server to compute the alignments. You can do so as well for a limited number of sequences, but for large numbers, you'd need to think about setting up your own hardware. Either way, we end off with an .a3m file containing the sequence alignment data. It looks like this. You can see that there is little metadata in the file because it was generated solely from the sequence given to ColabFold. It consists of alternating lines, one starting with a greater than sign and some scores, then followed by a sequence. The first sequence is the query sequence. It is from a tautomeris from E. coli and it's also the default sequence when you open up ColabFold. The sequences immediately below it consist only of letters, which means they don't contain insertions or deletions, only substitutions. The second sequence has 50.8% identity to the target, and the third one has 40.6% identity. In line 23, we've got an insertion for the first time. It's represented by the dash at the end of the sequence. This means that compared to this sequence, the target sequence had an amino acid inserted at this position. Further down in line 393, we have our first deletion. The amino acids glycine, glutamine and glycine, represented by the lowercase characters G, Q, G, are present in this sequence but not in the target sequence. Note that when talking about insertions and deletions here, we can't really tell if these truly were insertions or deletions because we don't know the evolutionary history. If our target protein was older than the homolog sequence, it might be the other way around. By insertions and deletions, we mean the terms as starting with a homolog sequence, then going to our target. Basically, AlphaFold uses two pieces of information from the MSA. First, the types of amino acids at each position, for some of the sequences individually as one-hot encodings and for others as averages over a group. And second, the position and number of deletions in the sequences. To go through with this, the first step in feature extraction is the following. For all sequences in the file, we look for lowercase characters, which are deletions. We count how many deletions are on the left side of each residue. After that, we discard the deletions. We don't take the actual types of deleted amino acids into account, only their number. Note that after we did so, all sequences have the same length as the target sequence. AlphaFold only uses sequences that are unique after removing the deletions. The A3M file could, theoretically, contain two different sequences that differ only in the number and types of deletions. If that is the case, we only keep the first one. After removing the deletions, all sequences are one-hot encoded using 22 classes, the 20 amino acids and the unknown and gap tokens. This includes the very first sequence, which we did a separate one-hot encoding for earlier with 21 classes, to construct the feature target feed. The one-hot encoded sequences are of shape number of sequences, number of residues, 22. We additionally calculate the distribution over the different amino acids at each position by calculating the mean over the different sequences. This distribution is used later to resample some of the amino acids. You can think a moment about why taking the mean over one-hot encodings calculates the distribution in the sequence. The one-hot encoded vectors can be thought of as votes for the position in the distribution, and averaging these votes is simply the distribution over them. After this initial file processing, feature extraction in AlphaFold follows five steps. First, AlphaFold randomly selects a number of sequences as so-called cluster centers. These sequences are directly considered in the features, while the other extra sequences just contribute as averages over the clusters. After cluster selection, the cluster centers are randomly changed, which is called masking in the paper. Then, the extra sequences are assigned to the cluster center they are most similar to. The deletion counts and amino acid types are averaged over the clusters, and finally, 
The features we get in this way are stacked to create the full MSA feed feature. We will go through this step by step, starting with the selection of cluster centers. We randomly select a number of sequences as cluster centers, always including the target sequence as the first center. For each of the cluster centers, we extract the deletions and amino acids individually. For the other sequences in the cluster, we average them. The cluster centers aren't chosen to be specifically well distributed. We simply generate a random permutation of the index range 1 to number of sequences, prepend the index 0 to always include the target sequence first, and then select the first 512 of these as cluster centers, while we gather the rest as extra MSAs. Next in line is cluster masking. Before the extra sequences are assigned to the cluster centers, the cluster centers are randomly modified to increase the robustness of the model. Note that this regularization isn't only used in training, but also during inference, which means we need to implement it as well. This process is called masking, and it involves the following steps. With a probability of 15%, each position in each cluster center is selected for potentially being substituted. For all selected positions, there is a 10% chance of being replaced with a uniformly sampled random amino acid, a 10% chance of being replaced with an amino acid sampled from the MSA profile at its position, a 10% chance of not being replaced at all, which might also happen by the previous two steps, and a 70% chance of being replaced with a special token, the so-called masked MSA token. This is easy enough to implement using normal Python. In PyTorch, we have to think a little on how we can achieve this using tensor operations. The basic idea is to gather all these replacement distributions in a single distribution for each position in each cluster center, then sampling from that using torch.distributions.categorical. For example, the category of uniform sampling would be a distribution of 1 over 20, 1 over 20, that 20 times for the 20 amino acids, and two zeros for the unknown token and the gap token. The probability for the masked MSA token is concatenated in the end. We can calculate these distributions for the individual replacement pathways, scale them by the chance for the path, for example 10% for uniform distribution, and add them up. The masked option is considered by concatenating a 23rd token with probability 0.7. After sampling from the distribution, we create a mask with probability 15% and replace the residues with the sampled ones where the mask says so. The notebook will guide you through the exact implementation. After masking the cluster centers, the extra sequences are assigned to the clusters. The assignment simply counts how many residues in the extra sequence agree with the cluster center. This is called the hemming distance of the two sequences. Note that we only count agreement between amino acids. Agreement of gaps doesn't count. Each extra sequence is assigned to the cluster center it agrees with mostly. This can be evaluated using argmax. Additionally, we count how many extra sequences are assigned to each of the clusters. This cluster size is used in the next step where we calculate cluster averages. Here, we simply average the earlier extracted deletion count and calculate the amino acid profile at each position. For that, we need to add up the features for the extra sequences based on the cluster index they were assigned to. To do this in PyTorch, we can use the function scatterAd. We add the extra feature of every extra sequence to the cluster center feature it's assigned to. To get the average over the cluster, which includes the cluster center itself, we simply divide these sums by the assignment counts plus 1 to take the cluster center itself into account as well. This was the last real calculation. Now all that's left to do is gathering the features reconstructed and stacking them correctly. Here's a list of the individual tensors that Alphafold constructs from the .a3m file and which we went through over the last steps. The feature AA type is a one-hot encoding of the input sequence. Cluster MSA is the same for all sequences that were selected as cluster centers. Note that we need two additional tokens in the one-hot encoding, for gap tokens and mask tokens. The feature cluster has deletion is one for every residue in the cluster centers that has the deletion on its left and zero otherwise. Cluster deletion value actually counts the number of deletions on the left of each residue, then normalizes it by two over pi times arctan of d over three where d is the number of deletions. This maps the values to a range of 0 to 1, which is better suited as a network input. The features extra MSA, extra MSA has deletion and extra MSA deletion value are identical to the ones for the cluster centers, but calculated for all sequences that were not selected. 
These features will be used as input through the less complex, memory-friendly ExtraMSA stack. For the main input, the extra sequences only contribute as averages for each cluster, by the features cluster deletion mean and cluster profile. They contain just what the name suggests. Cluster deletion mean is the average number of deletions left to each residue for each sequence in the clusters, normalized to the range 0, 1 using arctan again, and cluster profile is a distribution over the amino acids at each position. Note that the averages also include the cluster centers. After the calculation of the individual features, the last thing we do is to concatenate some of them to get the final inputs. The feature target feed is just the AA type feature. The feature residue index is a range of 0 to number of residues minus 1 to be used for positional encodings. The feature MSA feed is constructed by concatenating cluster MSA, cluster has deletion, cluster deletion value, cluster deletion mean, and cluster profile. The feature extra MSA feed is constructed by concatenating extra MSA, extra MSA has deletion, and extra MSA deletion value. Note that there is some randomness in the input creation, notably the selection of the cluster centers and during masking. As we'll see later, AlphaFold does its full prediction multiple times, recycling the predicted positions and other outputs in the newer passes. The inputs of the model are created for each run individually by repeating all these steps, which means they are somewhat different in each iteration due to the randomness involved. So, this is how feature extraction works for AlphaFold. Selecting the relevant input data and shaping it into tensors are key for using machine learning in new problem settings. I think it's really cool to see how we can do just that for a problem like protein structure prediction. You can find the tutorial notebook for today's topic in the description, where you'll build the full feature extraction pipeline for AlphaFold by yourself. In the next two videos, we'll see how the EvoFormer, AlphaFold's core module, transforms these features. And after that, we'll tackle the inverse of today's problem, which is going from tensors to actual protein structures. So, see you in the next videos, and happy coding!